Thank you, everyone, uh, both those who are here in person and those who are here online. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. For those of you who are online, uh, you can't see this beautiful room. It's a pleasure to be back in the former U.S. Patent Office Library. I think we have to find a way to recover it back for the PTO. Uh, uh, but um, uh, so I, I hope that today's lecture will be useful to you and, uh, hope, and that you'll get some ideas about what we do. I want to thank the library for arranging for this great opportunity. Uh, before I begin talking in great detail, um, I, I want you to think about whether the USPTO's engagement goes back over 200 years, 130 years, or maybe 35 years. You can decide. And if you're thinking about how I reach 200 years, which I thought was a bit of a stretch, uh, if, does anybody have a dollar bill? If you have a dollar bill, don't give it to me, but if you have a dollar bill, look at it. I, I don't need your dollar bill. Here's my dollar bill. Uh, that portrait of George Washington is the Athenian portrait of George Washington. It was painted by Gilbert Stuart. In 1803, Gilbert Stuart sued a Philadelphia merchant who had 99 copies of it made on glass, guess where? In southern China. Uh, it was one of the earliest copyright cases. It involved piracy, if you will, of George Washington's portrait, which was brought into the US and obviously was of great concern to Gilbert Stuart. Uh, so in some sense, IP issues bilaterally go back over 200 years. Uh, uh, I don't think the US Patent Office or the, uh, the patent examiners at that time were involved in that issue in particular, but um, nonetheless, there is a bit of history. We're going to cover about five topics today. The evolution of U.S. involvement in China's IP regime, the historical question, the impact of China's innovation policies, issues facing U.S. rights holders, dialogues and other means we use to improve the environment for U.S. rights holders, and how the USPTO team is working with China's patent office today. And I'll segue to my colleague Elaine Wu in the middle. We had a brief introduction about the China team collectively uh, we have 12 U.S. lawyers, five Chinese lawyers. I asked the team how long we've been working on Chinese IP issues, and we have about 200 years collective experience on Chinese legal matters, which is a lot, about 150 years collectively on Chinese IP issues. Uh, besides Elaine and myself, we have people dealing with trademarks, copyright enforcement issues. There's China Resource Center I just mentioned, and we have attaches in three offices in China. Uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, assisted by uh, a Chinese staff. That's a picture of Elaine, uh, of uh, Michelle Lee, our director, with the Beijing team, and a clip on this slide of an article written about me called Sisyphus in China. Actually, the first IP attaché overseas was yours truly, and the task was considered Sisyphean, as perhaps it remains today. Um, I mentioned you decide how many years we've been involved. This is, these two pictures are from the first patents filed at the U.S. Patent Office uh, from Chinese subjects, Chinese national subjects of the Emperor of China in the late 1800s. Dated 1887, 1886 or so. One was a patent for the process of preserving shrimp. Another one was an improvement on a Chinese lantern. They were both residents of the U.S. Uh, re they were subjects or citizens of Imperial China, resident in the U.S. The first one, we try to track these people down as kind of a, a hobby of mine, tracking down early, early patents involving Chinese. The first one, uh, fellow Yi Fu, was from uh, near Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, another patent, which will, uh, would, is not here, was uh, actually, I found very curious, was a fellow who was resident in New Jersey, uh, uh, and uh, about the same time, the late 1800s, there was another one from New York. And as best I could tell, because it was census records, I think he was a waiter in a Chinese restaurant who actually filed a patent that was subsequently cited on filtration of liquids. Uh, so kind of an interesting uh, situation. First litigation involving a U.S. patent holder occurred in China uh, this was a period of extraterritoriality where you could try civil or criminal matters before the U.S. Court of China. Uh, and this involved infringement of a U.S. patent 
by a British company, something called the Bonzac Cigarette Machine, tried by the Shanghai Consulate of the U.S. Embassy. Can I move this forward here? Let me see. Okay. And here's where it really gets interesting in terms of history. Uh, this is a patent. You can see on the right we're getting pretty technically complex, a kind of spinning machine. Uh, a Mr. Ding, in modern Chinese, his name would be Chen. He was from Fujian province. Uh, he acquired a patent in China. Now it's getting more like the modern system in 1897 from the Chinese empire. And that picture on my right uh, is um, a picture of the Zongliyamen, what one might have considered the State Department of Imperial China, which granted patents at that time. And Mr. Ding's patent was of such use that uh, two Americans purchased it and they, they took a license and they subsequently filed three patents in the U.S. Patent Office and they brought a litigation matter in China against an infringer to which the emperor of China or his officers responded, you cannot sue Chinese for infringing a Chinese patent. Uh, but for those of you who are interested in American history, then U.S. Secretary of State John Milton Hay, the former personal secretary to Abraham Lincoln, who was then, towards the end of his career, exchanged communications on enforcement of these patents in 1899, and it was reported to Congress. So there is some ancient, if you will, history on that. And there he is, Ding Tzu, I don't even know what it is in modern Chinese, a Fuzhou, China, who assigned the patents to George S. Minor and William N. Brewster, and it materialized into three patents. So we're gonna jump ahead, again, just for the sense of history, since I'm here in, in Maine Commerce, um, when I think of Commerce Department's involvement on Chinese IP issues and patent issues, I think of Jordan Baruch, who was Assistant Secretary for Science and Technology in the Carter Administration, went to China to lecture on patent issues, uh, just as China was emerging from the Cultural Revolution. And then a little later in the 1980s, Another person did a little work on innovation in China. Many of us know him very well, Craig Allen, who participated in a report on China's techn technology environment. Craig later served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for China and East Asia here at ITA and is currently serving as, as our ambassador to Brunei. Uh, Jordan Baruch, who I uh, was an office mate with at one time in private practice, has since passed away, but he always prided himself on how he was involved in the development of the Chinese patent system. So here you have it. China emerges out of the Cultural Revolution uh, where you didn't even have private ownership of property. And one of the first things they start to think about was enacting a patent law. And this is really remarkable in world history because if you looked at what happened in Eastern Europe, the first things that were happening there were Let's have a real property law. Let's have a personal property law. Let's own cars and apartments. But China is thinking, how can we enfranchise our intellectuals who felt so oppressed in the Cultural Revolution and give them something that they can own? And one of those things, a theme that really goes back to the 1880s and 90s is give them something in technology so that China can become an innovative economy as it was 500 years ago. 500 years ago, China was a leader in global technology. More steel, more uh, uh, paper, uh, more inventions came out of China than any other place in the world, perhaps any other place combined. Uh, so there's a sense of a Chinese renaissance, and uh, the patent law was really part of that vision. Uh, this fellow, Guo Shoukang, who was a personal friend, he's passed away, had to personally argue before the National People's Congress to say, China needs this. We need to give something to our innovative people, our intellectuals, our entrepreneurs, intellectual property so that they could own the fruits of their creation and ultimately succeeded in 1985. China's patent office, also called the State Intellectual Property Office, a little similar to the USPTO in the sense that they also have authority over all forms of intellectual property, but their primary work is in granting, examining and granting patents grants three types of patents. One of them are, is called an invention patent. In the US, we would call that a utility patent. 
that's examined for substance. It gives you 20 years protection for something that's new, useful, and non-obvious. Another one is something called a utility model patent, which patent lawyers here call a petty patent, and it protects any new technological solution relating to the shape or structure. And then there are design patents. Both utility model and design patents are not examined. In the US, we would examine design patents. We don't have utility model patents. So these are, are different systems. Utility model patents are found in Germany, Japan, and other countries. Design patents are found in many jurisdictions, including the US. But one of the things that distinguishes the Chinese system is these two types of, last two types of patents, utility models and designs, are not examined. They're only examined for formalities. So what you have now is, if we just look at it from the big picture, a China that decided it needed an IP system in the late 1970s, China that wanted to really reinvigorate its creative talent, uh, a lot of problems bilaterally because of counterfeiting, piracy, infringement, uh, and now today, a China that really wants to innovate. It's almost as if we had to be careful what we ask for, uh, uh, where, um, you know, many people would say in the past, is China really interested in, in intellectual property? I think almost everybody would answer today, yes, China is. At one point, people doubted that. Uh, so China is interested, but is it interested in a way where other countries can be equal partners, where U.S. companies or foreign companies will have an equal opportunity to play in the market, to uh, collaborate, to develop new products and technologies that serve global needs? Or will we find that this is a highly mercantilistic approach to innovation? Will, will China be the, as much the innovator to the world as it is currently the factory to the world? And what are the consequences of that? New York Times and others said, you know, when Innovation 2 is made in China in an article uh, 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 some years ago, uh, recognizing that now IP is part of China's plans. Uh, that innovation and particularly patenting is part of how China wants to see itself develop over the next five or 10 years ago. If you look at China in the 1950s, they wanted to have steel uh, 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 furnaces in every backyard during uh, uh, the Great Leap Forward. Today it's almost like they want patents in everybody's backyard, and I'll show you why in a moment. But it's a, a remarkable change that has good news and bad news. Uh, so here are some of their goals till 2020. 14 patents per 10,000 people. What does that mean? I mean, if you ask most people in the United States, patent lawyers, economists, they've not, what, is it, what is the U.S., how many patents per capita? Is that a meaningful number? This is very much a planned approach to innovation. They want to go from four patents per 10,000 in 2013 to 14 in 2020. Uh, uh, average number of patent, patent applications filed under something called the Patent Cooperation Treaty. They want to increase to 7.5. These are global patents, patents filed overseas. Average duration that patents are maintained, they want to have that grow from about six to nine. Copyright registrations, they want to increase. Computer software copyright registrations. Technology contracts that are registered. Uh, amount of financing that's collateralized by intellectual property. Patent royalty revenue received from overseas. China no longer wants to be a, a buyer of technology, and we'll talk for a moment about how much it does buy. It wants to be an exporter of technology. It wants to increase its exports from about 1.3 billion to $8 billion. And it wants to generate more revenue from IP services. It has its own satisfaction index. It wants to improve the way its government offices operate. Think about this, if this was translated into the United States. What would it look like? Can you imagine the Secretary of Commerce calling up the governor of, let's say, uh, New Jersey and saying, by the way, I see you only have five patents per 10,000. Are you gonna meet the national goal of 14? Is this something we would tolerate? Would that be meaningful? I think it would actually create a lot of distortions. And we'll see, in fact, how it does translate into um, in China. 
The other thing is uh, that we are now dealing with a system that, you know, at one time people would say, step back, people would say, China joins the WTO, they're going to have to conform to global standards, rules-based economy, rules-based trading system, rules-based intellectual property. I think most people, and I include myself in this, didn't think about how much the world might have to conform to the impact of China. And we see this to a degree in intellectual property. The USPTO used to be the largest patent office in the world uh, in terms of patent applications and grants, and also in terms of trademarks. Uh, we are now about one-third the size of China in terms of applications. Uh, and in many other areas that are intellectual property related, we are smaller. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does this reflect metrics or value? How much do we participate in this as Americans? Is this a rising tide lifting all? Or is it kind of a mercantilistic tide that really primarily benefits China? And does it even do that well? Well, one place we've seen this where there's a bit of a distortion is that China provides subsidies for patent applications. So one reason we see this rapid growth is that the Chinese government on a national or local level is providing subsidies to file a patent. Remember that metric, 14 patents per 10,000 or three in 2014? A major reason for that growth is that the government is saying, you apply for a patent, I'll pay your fees. I'll pay your legal fees and your application fees. Sometimes you'll even be able to get a profit, we've heard these stories, by filing for a patent. So the patent lawyers go out and say, why do you file for a patent? I, know I didn't invent anything. I don't care, file for a patent. We'll split, the, we'll split the profit. So you have patent data that may not as closely track innovation in China like it might in other countries because there are these kinds of distortions. So I ask this question, 14 patents per 10,000, what does that look like? It would look something like the state of California. California has 11.4 patents per 10,000 people. If these were all market-oriented, uh, but it would be California plus. It would be a little more than California. Now, Silicon Valley has a lot more than 14. I think it's about 60 or 70 patents per 10,000 people. But on average, California is about 11.4. So think about China as several Californias in terms, in terms of innovation. Is that a meaningful concept? Does that really represent innovation, or is that representing government metrics and planning gone a little bit amok? So if you want to look at subsidies and grants and the effect of planning and incorporation of IP into uh, uh, state metrics, uh, one way of approaching this, and I actually have a paper with some economists who are trying to get published on this, is seasonality in intellectual property. This is really unusual. Uh, in fact, when I go to China sometimes, I say if the China wants to innovate and they want to legislate to promote innovation, all they have to do is pass a law that there's only one season. It's autumn. And as, as bureaucrats, we know why. What happens in autumn? You got to spend your money, right? You have all this subsidy money to spend. You got to meet your goals of 14 patents per 10,000 people. You know, government people want to get promoted. So what happens is between August and December, 60% of all the patents get filed. Uh, uh, and then it drops again with Chinese New Year's, et cetera. This has been a pattern for 10 to 15 years. Most of the world, it does not have the same seasonality. Korea has something similar. Samsung and LG may be a bit that way. But in general, most countries and most companies file patents to respond to market needs, not because of extern externalities. So China invents in the autumn. I asked the question, how much do foreigners participate in this environment? And one of the things that's really, I think, people Find, find pe people find a little bit shocking is how small a role foreigners play in this IP environment. And it's, it's been true now for a couple of decades. But if you look at the amount of litigation as one example that foreigners bring for IP infringement, and China now is the most litigious society for intellectual property in the world. They used to say three things about China when I first took my trip. Chinese won't eat fast food, 
They won't drink coffee, and they don't sue. All three things have been disproven. McDonald's, Starbucks, and IP litigation. Uh, and, uh, at, but the thing is, foreigners are 1.8% of that docket, very small, and more or less a constant percentage in this huge environment. Why do we bring so many cases? Why do Chinese, why do we bring so few cases, and why do Chinese bring so many? And there, there's all sorts of reasons, perhaps, but um, this is a pattern that's repeated not just in the civil environment, China has this administrative enforcement mechanism, and we find that in general we play a rather small role in terms of uh, bringing litigations. Yet we're very vocal about IP infringement. Another place you see it is increasingly in who obtains the rights. And um, I don't know if I have a pointer here, but just to, if you can notice in red on this slide, this is 2013 data. Actually, the data we've just seen now in 2015 makes this trend even a bit uh, uh, worse. Numbers of invention patents. Remember I said those are the patents like U.S. patents, U.S. utility patents. In 2013, 85% of them came from Chinese filers. Now it's about 90%. So you have about 90% of the higher quality patents filed locally by Chinese entities, 10% by foreigners. But look at this, utility model patents, 99.2% filed by Chinese, and design patents, 97.7% filed by Chinese. People used to say in a kind of unexamined way, just kind of common sense, China won't protect IP until it has IP of its own to protect. You know, you can't expect China to invest in this system unless they have something invested in it. Uh, by this data, China is overwhelmingly a China-oriented IP environment. In fact, the U.S., by that kind of common sense saying, should have very weak IP protection because we have such a robust presence of foreigners in our market. In fact, it's the reverse. You can see by these numbers, as much as 99.2% of utility model patents are filed by uh, Chinese entities. Here's what it looks like in the U.S., just to give you a rough a rough uh, overview of what the US IP environment looks like in terms of foreign involvement. Four of our big six publishers are foreign owned. Four of the five largest science publishers are foreign owned. This was 2013. At that time, the top 10 best selling fiction authors, five were foreign. Two of the three major record labels were foreign. 13 of the 24 Oscar cat uh, winners were foreign and foreign residents obtained more US patents than US residents, about 61 more. So the U.S. actually has a much more foreign, inclusive environment than the Chinese. Um, this is not, you may hear, you know, that the, the Chinese say from time to time that, you know, foreigners dominate their system or something like that. Qualitatively, that's a topic open for discussion. Quantitatively, it's absolutely wrong. This is overwhelming, and one of the things that distinguishes the Chinese environment, I think, from other developing countries, is the degree to which Chinese actors quantitatively dominate their environment. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of revenue? And this is one of the things I was thinking as we put, as Elaine and I put this presentation together is trying to make this as meaningful as possible for our, our commerce colleagues. If you look at it in terms of revenue, licensing revenues for U.S. entities in terms of their sales of technology to China in 2013, we're about $5.7 billion. Uh, now, if you compared mainland China revenue with Taiwan, it was $5.2 billion. About a 10% difference that China uh, and China-based revenues with a much smaller market. But the other thing that's interesting about this is that most of the licenses of technology, the sales of technology from the U.S. to China were to affiliated entities, subsidiaries of U.S. companies. Very little was to an unaffiliated entity, someone just selling their technology uh, uh, to a Chinese entity. Uh, in Taiwan, most of the sales were to unaffiliated entities. In addition, China exported 19% of the world's high-tech goods but it only represents about 4% of 
of U.S. high-tech licensing receipts. If you did a very kind of voodoo economics, rough calculation, you would say there's a shortfall of 20 to $30 billion in how much the U.S. should derive from licensing technology in China. So to me, this is one of the great uh, uh, unexploited opportunities in business development, getting more revenue from licenses in China. At the same time, China complains. And this is one of the emerging issues in, in, in an antitrust context. China complains they're spending too much. They're too dependent on foreign technology. Uh, and one of the things my office and other offices, including here uh, uh, in Maine Commerce, are involved in looking at is China's antitrust environment. And a, here we have a Chinese judge quoted in a very high profile case who said that Chinese enterprises should bravely employ anti-monopoly lawsuits to break technology barriers and win space for development. This is a fantastic progression of issues that I've, for me anyway, that I've given to you in a short period of time, beginning with copying Gilbert Stewart's portrait onto glass in 1802 in southern China, counterfeiting and piracy, to all of a sudden now we're looking at high-tech issues, antitrust issues, uh, globalization of technology markets, China's role in that market and whether China will participate uh, as a player. Increasingly more complex and sophisticated issues. At the same time, whoops, can I go backwards here? Let's see, okay. At the same time, if we're looking at how this environment has changed, China is investing in the U.S. And one of the things we're trying to do at the PTO is to look at the IP element in those investments. Remember I said how much met metrics are incorporated into China's IP environment, how much they have goals of how many patents, how you can get recognized for being innovative based on how many patents you've acquired. Is the same thing happening here with Chinese investments in the U.S.? I don't know the answer to that, but I have noted, we have noted that Chinese investments in high-tech industries have increased rapidly in the United States, and they continue to increase rapidly, not just high-tech, but even cultural industries, acquisition of movie studios and the like. So I'm wondering how much of that is also related to China's own internal goals, which it, where it views IP, innovation, and more broadly, uh, creativity as part of its uh, vision for the future for its economy. data and the use of data to engage China, uh, to look at whether China's metrics are useful, to see whether U.S. companies are deriving the benefits that we would hope from the Chinese market, to determine whether we're being treated fairly or not, is one thing that we spent a lot of time on at the PTO in, in addition to some of the policy issues. And some of this you could see from a WTO case we filed back in 2007, where one of the claims the WTO later said had zero dollars associated if we were successful in winning it. This involved a customs claim. So one of the things that we've derived from that is the need to have a more data-driven analysis to support some of the cases, complaints, anecdotes that you hear. And that's one of the reasons we set up this IP resource center. The interesting thing about it is when we talk to the Chinese as you can tell, they're invariably much more data-oriented than we are. And we don't normally talk about 14 patents per 10,000 people or whether we've met our goal of how much in technology exports. China is, and actually, we found many times in engaging our Chinese counterparts, they respond very quickly uh, uh, and easily to the discussions around those metrics, and we can explore to them, with them about whether the metrics are meaningful. For example, Trade secrets are a very important IP issue. Uh, how do you reflect a trade secret in an IP metric? You can't. People don't report how much the trade secrets are, what the value are. They don't want you to know. By definition, it's a secret. So you naturally have an undervaluing of proprietary technology in China's in innovation uh, goals. Patents, okay, but is it meaningful to talk about what they are quantitatively? Um, before I turn this over to Elaine, I just want to, when you talk about concerns to U.S. rights holders, uh, the Chinese system is very different, not only because of these metrics, 
not only because of this overarching goal to become innovative again, the nature of the longstanding history, uh, but also the government's involvement in enforcement of intellectual property. You very much have a government management approach to IP. Uh, so you basically have a two-tier system where the government can fine you for intellectual property infringement. This is what's called administrative enforcement. And then you have courts. And to a certain extent, they sound the same. Oh, the China has courts, they have civil remedies. Uh, then they have this administrative remedy that's a little different. But really, they function quite differently. I mean, if you have a fine for infringement, it means you're not going to be compensated for infringement. And if you looked at this, as many people do, in terms of resources, you would see that China has a huge amount of resources invested in this administrative system. Some people estimate as much as three or 400,000 people dealing in IP issues and a lot of it in administrative enforcement. That's as much as a small European country. I think it's bigger than San Marino or one of those other countries. That's a lot of resources. You can say, well, they have so many people, how come we're complaining so much? Is the problem too much government involvement, not too little? If IP is a private property right, if it's a private property right, then shouldn't the solution be in people going to the courts ultimately and protecting their own property and getting compensated if someone uses it? Shouldn't the IP courts in particular, which is a new experiment, be an important part of that? In fact, the past year or so, China has established not one, but three separate IP courts, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, and we see a lot of expertise. We see a lot of, a number of judges who have a lot of depth of understanding on intellectual property. They hold a lot of promise if the legal system gives them the full authority to compensate rights holders, have fair procedures that are not politically slanted one way or another, uh, where private property owners can be compensated for, for their infringement. To a degree, I think, that effort would fulfill the vision of Professor Guo Shokong, the guy who had to argue before the National People's Congress that China's intellectuals needed a patent system, or even the late Qing emperor that recognized having a patent system would enable a Chinese renaissance by giving the incentives to individuals to create new technologies for which they would be rewarded. And I think if China does that well, and this is really a, a question I think that's a really big question, uh, really big consequences, if it does it well, the benefits would not be just for China, for the world, because if one-fifth of the world's population is innovating and creating and protecting and contributing, then I think we'll all benefit in new ideas and new solutions to global problems. And with that, I'll turn it to Elaine. Thank you, Mark. Don't forget your dollar. It's always hard to follow up uh, Mark Cohen, who is the world's IP expert in China. But with that introduction, I'm just gonna kind of get a little more granular and kind of bring this to a more practical space for a lot of uh, people who are uh, on WebEx and also here, uh, and, and talk to you really about a couple of things. Some of the uh, important patent-related issues of concern to U.S. rights holders, two main ones that I'll focus on. And then also a lot of the dialogues that we're involved in at the PTO with our uh, colleagues here at Commerce and USTR about some of the practical things we're trying to do uh, to deal with some of the issues that a lot of rights holders are concerned about in, in China. So let me talk uh, quickly about two of the main problems. One of them is concerns supplementation of data. And this is an issue of concern for a lot of our pharmaceutical comp companies. And it's uniquely something that is uh, a problem uh, that we've had to deal with, uh, particularly with SIPO. And in fact, Mark has done a lot of work on, on that uh, in that direction in some of the dialogues we've had. So uh, a lot of our pharmaceutical companies are unable to get patent protection for a lot of their compound patents in China. And these are very important 
uh, 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 compound patent, uh, very important products because a lot of them are uh, patented products for the active ingredient for a particular product or drug. And so it's very difficult uh, to get it for, because SIPO recently revised examination guidelines so that it wouldn't allow a lot of the biopharmaceutical companies to submit data post-filing. I'm not going to get into a lot of details because it gets kind of geeky very quickly. But suffice to say that SIPO's rules, examination guidelines, are quite stringent when compared to a lot of the other IP offices. So as a result, a lot of uh, companies while they were able to get patent protection for some of these compound pharmaceutical patents in other jurisdictions like Europe, like Japan, like Korea, they were not able to get it at SIPO. So that's something we're still working on and, and dealing uh, with SIPO directly and also with a lot of our other trading partners. Utility model patents. Mark has talked a bit about utility model patents, talked about the complex web of subsidies and incentives that are provided to uh, a lot of the applicants that file for utility model patents. And so, uh, and in fact, even by um, uh, SIPO's own recognition, the last commissioner, Commissioner Tian, had, had worried and said aloud in press re re releases that, uh, do we have a problem with junk patents or utility model patents? So are the issues in China very different and what makes the China situation somewhat pretty, pretty unique? And I, I would think that they are, and that's, uh, so I'll talk about that very briefly. So this is a, an example of kind of a uh, junk patent, basically often a, uh, which are often qual uh, copies of other technologies uh, that uh, basically a Chinese company sometimes does things like uh, there's the Xerox patent, which they get a, a patent that's already been issued and kind of make a Xerox copy of it and then just uh, uh, file it for it. And the reason for it is because, the reason they're able to even get it is because, as Mark has mentioned, these are not sub-examined by, uh, by SIPO. Whereas at the PTO, in contrast, we sub-examine all the patent applications we get. And as a result, if they're not sub-examined, then if it's been... Uh, apply for in the past or if there's any prior art that's there available, uh, that's not examined. So they wouldn't be able to determine that the patent, it's already been patented before and so they would issue the patent. So China has a unique, China's situation is unique in that unlike a lot of other countries and a lot of other countries that have patents or utility model patents, petty patents, uh, uh, Europe, I mean uh, Germany, uh, Korea, Australia, Egypt, Honduras, uh, and some of these jurisdictions also don't subsidy examine their patent applications. And so perhaps they're similar to China. But with China, you have the sheer number. The number is really overwhelming. And as a result, uh, it is going to, we think, uh, pro, uh, cause a lot of issues on enforcement because uh, you have to, once all these patents are granted, then you've got lots of concerns for a lot of the applicants uh, uh, with infringement, potential infringement problems. And as Mark has mentioned, China does have an administrative patent enforcement system. And one of the way, one of the reasons that, uh, that uh, SIPO has attempted to beef up that administrative enforcement system uh, is because of the onslaught or the potential onslaught of utility model patents that will clog the system. Uh, and uh, make problems for a lot of the applicants and a lot of the, the patent holders of these utility model patents. And so there's been an attempt by SIPO and uh, some other agencies within the Chinese government to uh, promote uh, more administrative enforcement authority just to deal with a lot of utility model patents. So I think in, in China, unlike a lot of other countries that have utility model patents, really the issue is, partially issue is, one of sheer number. Moving on to some of the U.S. government dialogues, and I think a lot of the, our colleagues here at Commerce and other uh, branches of the U.S. government that might be here are familiar with some of the dialogues that we're involved in. One of them is uh, ongoing WTO monitoring. There is an ongoing process to monitor China's compliance with its WTO obligations. A lot of us are involved in making sure that China continues to do that. We have two or three very large dialogues we deal with in China. One of them is called the Strategic and Economic Dialogue. Many of you, of course, are aware of that. And there are, on occasion, deliverables concerning China in the Strategic and Economic Dialogue. Recent uh, deliverables, and these are, of course, commitments, so-called commitments that China needs to adhere to, 
Whether or not they actually adhere to them is another matter. But these are commitments that both sides agreed to and China is supposed to adhere to. A lot of the recent deliverables uh, that rise to the level of the strategic and economic dialogue deal with issues concerning uh, tech technology localization. I won't go into in too much in detail about that. There, often they are issues that are of concern uh, that deal with a lot of other agencies, not only uh, the SIPO, not only the IP agencies, but a lot of other agencies. So they're kind of cross-cutting issues that are probably hard to solve in other dialogues, and so they kind of rise to the strategic and economic dialogue. We have, of course, the JCCT, the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade. USPTO and USTR are co-chairs of that dialogue. Uh, so we do a lot of work in that area. We have meet twice a year. We have breakout discussions where we sit in front of our, uh, our counterparts on the Chinese side and discuss on a pretty technical level a whole range of issues, trademarks, trade secrets, IP and innovation, IP and standards. Uh, examples of recent uh, agreements that we've got are deliverables from the Chinese on uh, at the JCCT include uh, a deliverable on uh, sports broadcasting and making sure that the sports broadcast that you see on TV that in the United States would be protected by copyrights uh, but are not protected in China, that they are indeed protected by a copyright system in China so that we have less examples of pirated sports broadcasting, a huge issue for NBC and a lot of the sports uh, broadcasting networks. Uh, we also have um, a discussion with uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology, which is our innovation dialogue discussion, uh, and uh, USPTO is particularly interested in using that innovation dialogue discussion to discuss some of the more uh, uh, concerning issues concerning uh, patent-related matters. Uh, and so that's something that we also get involved in, and uh, uh, we think it's a good way to hopefully dialogue with the Chinese on some of these pressing issues. This is just an illustration uh, to explain how issues have migrated. As, as Mark has mentioned, now a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in China are technology-related issues, patent-related issues. And this just illustrates that only in 2007, uh, when we had the WTO dispute with China, uh, our main issue with China at that one time was a more conventional issue of counterfeit products, counterfeit uh, uh, clothes or pirate DVDs or pirated DVCs, optical disc media piracy was a whole huge issue with China, uh, and it remains so, but this is the migration of where issues have gone into a, an area that's more complex, uh, more difficult, and an area in which in certain ways, even here in the U.S., we are grappling with some of these very issues that are, we are dealing in with China concerning, for example, IP and standards, IP and antitrust. Uh, these are the issues that we're dealing with China. We're dealing with somewhat internally here at the U.S., but this is an, an illustration of how the migration of issues have gone from the conventional to the non-conventional and cutting edge. So finally, a couple of uh, ways that we are discussing these issues with SIPO directly. And I have listed a whole list of all the things that we're doing with SIPO. I'm not going to go into detail uh, so that we can allow you some time to ask questions. But uh, one thing that I think we um, share in common with SIPO is that, as Mark has mentioned, we do a lot on policy initiatives and working on policy, IP policy. So one of the things that we like to discuss with SIPO is what is the role of the PTO and SIPO on a lot of the cutting-edge issues that Mark had mentioned earlier and that we are grappling with both offices. So we like to be able to cooperate on these cutting-edge issues with SIPO. Uh, one of the reasons that we do so much of the things that we, we do with SIPO here that, that's on the slide is to uh, convince SIPO in an indirect way through training and through commenting on their laws and regulations that uh, some of the experience that we've had with our patent system here at the U.S. is probably instructional and useful for them as they also grapple with some of the issues, some of the issues that we have already grappled with for the 200 years of history that we have had at the USPTO with the patent law. Uh, finally, um, we are also working with SIPO on what's called a patent prosecution highway, and I'm going to turn to my next slide because that deals with some of that uh, our, our work with SIPO through what's called IP5 cooperation. So 75% of all patent filings 
uh, in the world go through one of these five offices, uh, either the European Patent Office, Japan Patent Office, Korea, China, or USPTO, 75% of world filings. So the objective of the IP5 framework of discussion, which was developed in 2007, is to find a way to collaborate with all these offices so that we can reduce work among these offices. So that if, for example, if you're an applicant and you file in all these five offices, is it possible that in the subsequent offices in which you file, the examiners can reuse the work that has been done in an earlier office? That will save everybody time, it will save a lot of resources, and it will save the applicant money, which is what's most important. So one of the cornerstones of what we do in the IP5 is to promote this concept of sharing work among the offices so we can eliminate waste, so we can el eliminate um, uh, and, and also streamline the process. And finally, one big thing that we have just unveiled about IP5 cooperation is an initiative called the Global Dossier. This has just been developed uh, uh, at the PTO, and what Global Dossier means is that when, now when you click on the PTO, you can actually view the family of patent applications that you have filed among these five offices. You can see what examiners have said about your applications, and you can look at uh, look at them more closely, and again, this is an attempt to streamline and uh, the efforts uh, and make it easier for the applicant and save the applicant money. So finally, this is just a couple of photos about heads of office meetings that we've recently had with the commissioner of SIPO, Commissioner Shen, who is uh, 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 recently uh, may uh, become commissioner about the last three or four years. Uh, Commissioner Shen is, uh, is, not, uh, um, is new to SIPO uh, uh, and is very politically connected, and so we think having a cooperative uh, uh, agreement, which was signed actually very recently uh, in 2014 with Commissioner Shen, is very helpful for both offices. And then finally, also, uh, this is uh, Director Lee uh, of the PTO, who very recently was able, just last year in fact, was able to, because of Commissioner Shen, meet with Vice Premier Wang Yang, who is uh, uh, one of the few Vice Premiers in, in uh, the Chinese government, uh, the, f the former top leader of Guangdong province, uh, and we, she was able to have a very uh, important and unprecedented meeting. This is the first time that a director has met with a vice premier level person, and partially it's because of uh, some of the work that uh, Commissioner Shen was able to do. He was able to uh, pr uh, promote that meeting and, and work on it. Um, so um, that's the end of my part of it, and Mark is going to come back up to talk about some of the, the stuff that we have in store that might be of interest to the commerce community in the near future. Uh, and also to get my dollar bill. The, 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 uh, um, yes, yeah, so just a couple of things if you're interested in this area. Uh, there's a lot of things we try to do in terms of outreach, both within USG and to industry, and including even to Chinese uh, industry. Uh, one of the things that is um, very USG oriented is what we call our Everything You Want to Know program. We do this every summer. We've been doing it for about a dozen years, uh, where we bring together experts from within commerce and other agencies and industry to kind of do a China IP update. Everybody is invited to that within the government. We actually get a lot of examiners from PTO, but we get a lot of people from outside PTO, and that will happen this summer. We frequently have um, a guest speaker uh, a, a little bit outside of uh, uh, the usual. Uh, this year I've been in touch with Simon Winchester, uh, who's written several books on uh, China, uh, and other areas of popular author, and he's expressed an interest. I hope he, I hope he does come. Uh, the, we have IP roadshows where we reach out to U.S. industry. We're always interested in working with ITA and others, UZX, uh, on that. Uh, the next one will probably be in conjunction with the training program we're doing. It'll be in Madison, Wisconsin in April, and then we're hoping to do another one in Washington, D.C. at USPTO. Uh, uh, and uh, we're always interested in ideas about how we can reach out to U.S. industry either here or obviously in China with our attaches. Uh, a little bit more narrowly focused, we have a program with George Washington University that's gonna be patent focused on April 14th. We have a licensing program in June with George Mason University. We have another licensing program in Beijing with the Ministry of Commerce. We're hopeful on doing an entertainment law program 
in light of all the developments in entertainment law, Disney theme parks, Universal, uh, China's efforts to ramp up its cultural industries to do something in Los Angeles on that topic. We're going to be doing some outreach to foreign invested R&D enterprises in China and talking about creating a positive R&D environment in China. And something I know that's of great interest to many is um, uh, the online environment where we're trying to put together through the JCCT a kind of task force, reach out to U.S. and Chinese industry, law enforcement, policymakers on how to improve the uh, online environment uh, to deal with the problems of counterfeiting piracy and, and other issues. Uh, and then we're always interested in other ideas that you might have, uh, whether they're granular and very geeky or broad spectrum uh, about how to bring value to U.S. industry and help U.S. companies and our colleagues in the government better understand and strategize in the, in, the, in the challenging Chinese environment. And with that, I'll ask Elaine to come back up. And if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. Um, two quick reminders before we get into Q&A. The slides, WebEx recording, and video will all be available on the library website. Um, so if you want to review or share with your colleagues later, it should be within a week or so. Um, and to the folks in the audience, when you ask questions, we just want to remind you to use a microphone so that the virtual audience can hear you. Um, we'll start with any questions in the room to begin. Eugene. Please show slide number 26. Pattern for what others? Slide six? Uh, number 26. Oh, 26, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think. Uh, pattern for what others? Yeah, this one. Yeah. At the bottom, at the bottom you can see the Chinese character to a. To R. I think the letter two should move to the right. Uh, it could be. It could be. It, it, Thank you. I, I think I, I had put this together to try to assemble something from a much broader document. Uh, but this gives an example of uh, how utility models can be filed for almost anything. Uh, in fact, one, another example we sometimes use is there is a patent filed for a um, grass mat with a cloth border. In Chinese, we call it cao uh, xi, tatami mat, uh, which is probably dates to the 10th century in China. Somebody filed it, and they actually sued and won until the patent was invalidated. So these things, they look like they're just nuisances, but and who would think that someone invented a battery in the past 10 years? Obviously not. But they're entitled to a presumption of validity until proven otherwise, and they can create real economic costs to Chinese or U.S. companies. And of course, if you think of it from another perspective, if you have roughly two million patent applications and you're investing in China and you want to analyze whether you have freedom to operate, the likelihood you'll be sued for infringement, if you have hundreds of thousands of unexamined patents, that's an exceedingly different, difficult undertaking to accomplish, to tell, to tell your client, yeah, you're not likely to be sued because these patents haven't even been examined. There's no assessment of their validity or utility. And I was just going to add really quickly that uh, one of the common scenarios is, uh, say you have, you're a U.S. company and you uh, work with a Chinese manufacturer uh, and have some sort of relationship with them, but some, for some reason that relationship doesn't survive a Chinese manufacturer may misappropriate your utility model or your design or whatever it is that you have it, but you, you at the U.S. company, often what happens is that because you don't intend to market in China, or you may not want to sell in China at all, you've not filed for a patent application in China yet. So what happens is that that company misappropriates, uh, often a Chinese company, and then files for a utility model patent and that sometimes asserts that against you. So that's another scenario that happens and is, of course, problematic for our, our companies, particularly our smaller U.S. companies. Anyone else in the room? I've got quite a few queued up on WebEx. So Mark, I'm just curious, do you have uh, any story, any case, like a U.S. company, you know, find some Chinese 
some they they steal their patent, but they sue the Chinese company and then they won. Yeah. Do you have you know yeah, so this, this the Chinese is the government really kind of uh, make commitment, you know, to this patent protection. So th there there if you look at the data, uh, and I have no reason to seriously doubt this data, the likelihood of winning an intellectual property dispute as a foreigner in China is greater than you're winning a case in the United States. Yeah, so the success rates are actually quite high. But the incidence is low. So 1.8%, so what I assume is happening is people are only suing on cases where they feel like they absolutely have to win. If it's a question of doubt, they think it's too difficult to litigate in China. So there, there have been several cases where U.S. companies have won. Uh, uh, there have been software piracy cases where U.S. companies have won. There have been patent cases where U.S. companies have won. There have also been a number of cases recently where U.S. companies have lost. And there's a concern that, in fact, the tide may have changed a little bit where Chinese are becoming more aggressive and U.S. companies, foreign companies, are being put into more of a defensive position. You may recall some years ago, actually, when uh, Carlos Gutierrez was secretary, one of the big cases involved Pfizer. Pfizer had a patent for Viagra. Uh, uh, it was for a new use of, of, via, of the chemical compound. Th Pfizer had lost those patent litigations in many jurisdictions throughout the world. They won in China. Uh, uh, so, I mean, it's hard to make comparisons. There are different reasons. But the interesting thing, if you, if you try to look at the data and cases and try to kind of abstract what is the strategy for the average American company, this is my theory, uh, uh, which is that American companies feel like they have to obtain patented trademark rights for their core IP. So although the numbers are relatively small, they do represent high quality. And they actually will exhaust their legal remedies protecting that right. So they'll sue the patent office or trademark office. But in terms of infringing, they're very careful when they want to get compensation. So they really look at IP as a long-term issue. Patents last 20 years. They may not be able to enforce it today, but maybe five years from now they will. Uh, they want to have it in their, uh, 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 in their quiver, so to speak, to use at the right time. Okay, one more in the room. Hi, uh, yes. Um, I wanted to go back to your issue that you had a moment ago about misappropriation of the, of the patent. If you have, I'm in textiles, and we have uh, textile companies working in China with um, high-tech fabrics as well as special design. So let's say the partnership or the relationship dissolves, um, and you have the Chinese then taking or stealing and misappropriating the, the patent what would you advise the company to do? Should they have applied for a patent in China prior to even going in there? Is that, and then what, if they did not do that, what recourse do they have in this particular scenario? Great question, and it's, it requires probably a longer answer than we can do justice, so if we wanna talk about doing something even with companies directly, we'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, um, the uh, short answer is, in general, not just related to clothing, textiles, garments, is that um, this is a world that's globalized and you shouldn't wait until your product is manufactured or introduced in the Chinese market until you secure the relevant rights. So people who are waiting until after they've signed the deal may find that Alibaba is selling counterfeit products globally using a mark that was duly registered in China or other rights that were obtained. So waiting is generally a very poor strategy and it puts you in a defensive position where it's much more expensive to get your rights back if you're able to at all. Uh, in terms of clothing and textiles, you have a, a different assortment of rights in China than the United States. So one thing, textile patents are protected by copyright. You don't have to register a copyright to enforce that. Uh, clothing designs may be protected by design patents. They may also be protected by another form of copyright called applied art. Uh, if it's a design patent, you should secure it, just like furniture. And actually, the beauty 
of the Chinese system for foreigners is that some of it is quite inexpensive to secure rights. Your design patent is actually very cheap because it's not examined. A lot of the expense for a patent application in the U.S. is talking to the patent office, talking about whether it's new, comparing it to prior art. This is not examined. In fact, I teach a course at Fordham on Chinese IP law, and one of my friends said to me, Mark, why don't you tell all your students to apply for a patent the first day of class? They'll get it in two months, and then they'll really get something out of the class. It may not be a valid patent, but they'll get a piece of paper out of it in addition to a grade. So it's possible, anybody could get a patent in China. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, 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 enforceability, validity, another issue. But there are a bundle of rights, some of which don't exist here, uh, some of which exist here at greater expense that you can secure. You can secure. Copyright, in particular, has a potentially greater scope of protection in China than the United States which can really be useful for entities involved in any kind of industrial design. And, and just to amplify what Mark has said is, you know, the, the, the thing we've heard from a lot of practitioners or a lot of uh, applicants here is, we don't have utility model patents in the U.S., so people don't know what to do with it. But, but uh, I, I don't, I, we're not here to really scare you from actually applying for a utility model patent. I think a lot of the people yeah. that, in our road shows that we talk to when we go out across the country, we actually tell people, apply for utility model patent. It, the system is there for particularly small companies, and like a lot of countries who adopted a utility model patent system, it's very useful uh, for the small company uh, and uh, to kind of get a start, uh, a start. Uh, and, and getting a petty patent or utility model patent is just one good step, so yeah. we, we encourage it. Uh, uh, also, another thing to keep in mind in general on the IP environment in China, which I think creates a lot of challenges for government and industry, is that this is a very rapidly growing, very time-sensitive, short-fused environment. So just like you can get a design patent, I've heard in one week in certain parts of China, in the furniture sector uh, in particular, uh, uh, you can, litigation is typically six months, uh, and the U.S. patent litigation could go on for several years. Uh, it has a different meaning or significance, but this is an environment that changes very rapidly. Uh, and because of that, strategies that take nine months of deliberation in a boardroom are likely to be outdated by the time they're utilized in China. So you really have to think about what you can do quickly to respond to a very dynamic environment. Great, um, a question from the WebEx folks. Most of the office actions done by foreign offices seem to be very lenient compared to the USPTO practice. Therefore, the claims for the same applications when issued are different at the US office, as the US office seemed to force the applicants to further narrow the scopes of the claims. How is this dealt with? Does that make sense? Well, you know, actually, um, what, what we've dealt with, I don't know if this answers directly the question, but in, in a broad general way, I think what we found when dealing with a lot of emerging offices, and we found this with Japan, I think we found this with China, and in fact, a lot of the claims they allow are actually a little more narrow in scope. And in fact, what, some, sometimes through the evolution of uh, the, the patent office practice, uh, that scope has probably broadened a bit. That's what we found. And in, in a certain, to a certain extent, uh, some of the issues that are co of concern to us concerning examination guidelines and so on is partially, uh, partially uh, I don't want to say all of them are like that, but partially it's kind of an evolution issue. As, as the uh, patent office becomes uh, uh, older and uh, more experienced, then we notice that some of the claims become broad. This, this we happened, we, we found out with Japan, um, I don't sure about Saipo to a certain extent, but I think that that's sort of the evolution we're seeing, or we have seen in the past. Um, one in the audience. Thank you for the presentation. really informative. Um, so I have a question. Um, we met with this uh, um, large uh, digital engine company a couple of days ago, and uh, they manufacture in China, and uh, but they saw some um, um, uh, fake 
kind of uh, filters that I see all over uh, Africa market. So that's a serious issue for them. And uh, two questions for you. One is, um, what do you suggest the company to do um, to deal with this issue? Second is, um, at the advocacy center, we deal with companies um, in daily basis. And uh, what do you see that there's something there we can do to support your effort? Thank yeah. you. So I, I think on, on the first point, it's, uh, this is a, 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 a regrettably too common a problem that we see counterfeits and pirated products appearing in third country markets. In fact, AmCham, I think, uh, AmCham Beijing and the regular surveys that pointed this out as a priority item from time to time. Uh, the, the very short answer is that Chinese Customs has a remedy against exports of counterfeit and pirated goods. Uh, that's not a WTO requirement, that's kind of WTO plus, and that's one way to detain goods prior to export. Uh, 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 so that's positive, and you can register online. Uh, if the goods are ultimately delivered to you know, some port in Africa, then you're gonna have to deal with the issues under African law. Uh, uh, so it, all things being equal, if you can find a remedy in the country where it's being manufactured or exported, uh, and you get the support of the government, that's always better. Uh, when you're dealing with manufactured goods, you have a built-in problem that, um, particularly in China, that uh, the locality where the jobs are located to manufacture, manufacture the goods may be protective of the manufacturer, which means that the ultimate remedy, which is to shut down the factory producing the infringing goods, may not be as effective or easily available as you would hope, which means sometimes you bring remedies like seizing goods in warehouses or upon export where there are fewer jobs associated with the manufacturing and you may be, it may be easier to get an effective remedy. Um, in terms of advocacy, you know, we're always happy to work with our ITA colleagues. Of course, we have attaches all over the world, which can also be helpful in uh, finding ways where we, we can collaborate together. Um, uh, uh, and in, in our office, we have people handling all different regions uh, so th there are ways of collaborating in that way, but if you're looking at China-related efforts, you know, outreach, case-specific advocacy, working with Stephen Mitchell back there and, and others in, in the Commerce Department, uh, I, I tend to think, and I, and I hope this doesn't sound glib, that the attaches in our office is best suited where possible to dealing with wholesale problems and that advocacy at the advocacy center, some of the ITA efforts, uh, uh, and I don't want to minimize the importance of much more case-specific efforts. So, um, you know, if there's an issue involving exports of counterfeit goods, a particular ports not doing a good job, particular products, local areas where counterfeit goods are widely produced, and we know many of them exist in China, uh, Putian for uh, counterfeit sneakers, there's another place that makes a lot of counterfeit spark plugs, a lot of this, different parts in China where we can really make, begin to make uh, inroads on what are systemic issues is something where I really feel like we could do a lot more and perhaps identify some of those things together to try to make a difference for our businesses. Great, um, let's see if we can crank through a, a few, hopefully quicker WebEx questions. Um, do you know what percentage of Chinese national applications are also filed in the US? So you have, you have a phenomenon, I don't know of the exact percentage, maybe Elaine does. You, actually, China has become a bigger filer in the United States, uh, 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 and we've been pleased by that growth. The filing tends to be dominated by two companies, Huawei and ZTE, uh, international filings. Uh, um, the, the, it's not, we're not in a situation where Chinese filings in the U.S. Approach their domestic filings is such a significant percentage. If it were, then we'd have a problem that at the end of the year we'd have a huge surge in Chinese applications, and ha we'd have maybe even an HR issue in terms of how our, how our examiners would handle this huge demand. Uh, but we are seeing a ramp up not only in quantity, but I think most interestingly and promisingly is quality, which is to say that the likelihood that a Chinese patent application will result in a grant of a patent, the allowance rate, now approaches Japan or Korea. It may even have exceeded that. It's probably higher than the average U.S. application. Uh, and in addition, pendency, the amount of time to issue the patent, 
has also been reduced significantly, perhaps because Chinese have become more familiar with our procedures. So overall, the trends are very positive. We've also seen a closer relationship between the products Chinese ma China manufactures and exports and the areas they're applying for patents for. So in the past, there may have been a high element of R&D institutions, research organizations applying for patents. Now we're seeing cell phone companies and semiconductor companies, what have you, that are exporting to the U.S. So that means there's a closer relationship with the commercial needs and markets. Great. Um, do you expect that in the future, as Chinese filings in the U.S. explode, well, we will see U.S. courts enforcing Chinese patents while Chinese courts do not enforce the U.S. patents. Well, the, the, to the second point, statistically, Chinese courts are enforcing U.S. patents. We can argue about damages and the like, but uh, it, it's, it, it, the, it, it hasn't been a horror story in terms of likelihood of winning. If the, the bad news is there's so few cases. We have seen increasingly uh, Chinese cases in the U.S., and in fact, that if anybody is interested we run a bi-monthly newsletter where we summarize for USG only litigation in the US courts that, to the extent we can find it involving Chinese plaintiffs or defendants. Most of them are Chinese defendants. Uh, there was one very promising, very interesting case in California involving CCTV and copyright infringement, which they won. Uh, and we've seen cases, there was a trade, a, uh, recently a trademark case involving Xiaofeiyang, a little fat sheep, a very famous mark for a kind of mutton restaurant in, in China. So we are seeing more and more, and I, th I heard recently that one of the Chinese cell phone companies may just have brought a suit for patent infringement. So, and I expect Chinese companies will be treated just like any other company, domestic or foreign, in this market. Uh, if they're filing higher quality patents, then they'll probably have a good chance of success. Um, if utility model and design patents are not examined, are they protected by the government? Yeah, so it, it very, you, you can go to a website called Ciela, C-I-E-L-A, I -E -L -A, believe it's Ciela.cn. Uh, they don't report on all the cases that are filed, but they do report on a nice group of them, about 30,000 plus cases, and you could compare through that snapshot process likelihood of success on particular cases, likelihood of getting an injunction, whether you'll get an apology, uh, amount of damages. Utility models and design patents have a pretty good uh, injunction rate, a decent level of damages, and pretty good win rate. Uh, so their litigation value is high. Great, all right. Two left on WebEx, and I'm gonna combine them together, and then we will let everyone go back to the rest of their day. Um, you, the U.S. subsidizes small and micro entity filing of patents. Does China subsidize based on size as well? Um, and then additionally, is discovery in IP litigation quite different in Chinese systems as opposed to the U.S. federal court system? Maybe I'll take discovery, you'll take the subsidy. Is that okay, Elaine? Yeah, so let me just briefly answer the discovery issue. Um, you know, the U.S. system has been criticized for having very robust and expensive discovery procedures, and some people are trying to cut down, particularly on the cyber discovery, electronic discovery, which can be quite expensive and time-consuming, almost like fishing expeditions. China gets criticized on the reverse side for not providing enough opportunities to compel an adverse party to produce evidence uh, that is against its interest. The courts have limited authority, and there's limit, limited procedures in place. Uh, so this makes it very difficult in certain kinds of IP litigation. Probably the most glaring example is trade secrets, where this secret confidential information is almost certainly in the hands of the adverse party. So lack of discovery can really reduce win rates. And in fact, trade secret cases are probably the most difficult IP cases to win in China. There have been some modest efforts to change this in China. Uh, uh, the trademark law provides, uh, as revised, provides for a modest discovery on damages, and we're seeing similar efforts in uh, copyright and patents. Uh, in addition, we would hope that China would cooperate more with the U.S. requests for evidence production through the Hague Convention and other mechanisms where amount of cooperation has been very limited, but when you have transnational cases, and increasingly this is a cross-border environment, the ability of courts to cooperate effectively in a timely manner can help uh, all sides in reaching effective and fair resolutions of issues. 
now on subsidies, uh, so uh, the, the subsidies that uh, the Chinese companies are provided uh, for filing and so on and aren't necessarily tied to the size. We've, we've also heard that at least at the central government level, supposedly they don't have any subsidies. We keep on hearing that. We're not, to be honest, completely positive that that's the case. But that means that at the provincial level, we do continue to hear that there are subsidies that are provided for filing, for filing outside of China, and also uh, for maintenance. So we have heard that there are subsidies to maintain your patent. There are maintenance fees at SIPO, just as there are at USPTO to maintain the patent. Uh, and uh, so if you went to any of the provincial websites, and we've gone to a couple of them, uh, for example, we had a group that came from Anhui province not too long ago, and we asked, asked them uh, about subsidies, and they said, uh, yeah, we do provide them, it's on our website. Uh, and not only are they subsidies, but there's also a whole level of other incentives. For example, if you're a university professor and you want to reach tenure, then you, you know, filing more patents may help you along the way. So it's not only just flat out money, or uh, it's also a lot of other uh, complex uh, web of other kinds of incentives to promote the metrics that Mark had uh, mentioned earlier. Yeah, but before, before we close out, I just want to make one, one or two just quick comments. I think uh, for those of you who are still listening, I hope you're interested in this topic. Uh, I think we certainly are. Uh, there are tremendous challenges and tremendously interesting issues to explore. Uh, uh, um, issues involving subsidies, innovation policy, history, uh, uh, perception, uh, 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 how to collaborate with China, implications for the future, lots of industrial specific issues, issues involving how do we respond better as a government or industry, uh, emerging hot issues with China is looking at very similar topics as Elaine mentioned as the, as the U.S. So this is really a lot of rich intellectually stimulating material that is also very demanding and so we welcome any support or interest on your part. We also have the possibility in the PTO of taking on uh, detailees. Uh, Xiaoping was, was one of them in the past uh, from other parts of the U.S. government and particularly the Commerce Department. And if you're interested in that, contact Elaine or me. Uh, we're always interested in people coming to help us and also sharing their perspectives and learning from you as we hope you would learn from us. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for coming. So interesting and relevant to what everyone does. Um, and thank you all for sticking around. Great. Until next time, everybody. Thank you.